Hi, this is uh, Sean McGee from European News Weekly. Um, I'd like to bring you uh, to an interview with Professor Chris Busby, who's been involved with the British Nuclear Test Veterans case in the High Courts in the UK. Um, now, he has a, a small team of people helping him. Um, he's been taking a huge workload on um, and uh, been put up against a, a much larger uh, judicial uh, sort of uh, side. So there's a lot of people who are working uh, um, to prove their point. And Chris and just a few people are managing, in my opinion, to prove theirs. But uh, what I'd like to do, I'll bring Chris, Professor Chris Busby, who's very kindly uh, decided to uh, have a, a brief talk about this as much as he can, uh, given the uh, uh, situation uh, that there's a court case going. Uh, we can have a, a small update with some details um, and we're just going to bring that to you now. So uh, Chris, uh, you've just uh, finished this week with a court case I believe and uh, it was uh, another stage uh, of a, a multi-year sort of process that we've discussed in the past. Um, would you like to uh, bring us to uh, what might have happened that you can tell us uh, that happened in the court and uh, what the judge's findings are? Right. Well, um, we we were on uh, on up in the Royal Courts of Justice, uh, and the main purpose of of the hearing was to discuss uh, the various disclosure requests that we had made. That's we uh, we we want to have information about the nature of the bombs and particularly the substances which were present in the fallout, uh, and also we are asking for disclosure of documents which are. Uh, which tell us about the the um, the genetic damage in the children of the veterans. Uh, there's a lot of data in the University of Dundee that they're not releasing. So, I mean, basically, if you have a if you have a case in which you're trying to prove that that your people have got cancer or had cancer as a result of their exposure to radiation, then you might you might want to get hold of all the documents that exist in the records that showed that radiation existed. Um, at the time, and that they and they measured various levels of radiation uh, uh, on Christmas Island at the test site there, and also at Maralinga in Australia, uh, so that you could say, well, um, try, you know, tribunal judge, that here here is evidence that these people were exposed to radiation, and this is the amount of radiation, and this is the evidence that shows that it causes cancer. But all along, right through the whole series of of trials and tribunal hearings that have existed. Right back to 2009 or earlier, uh, it's been impossible to get the Ministry of Defence to release documents, which they clearly have, which say uh, how much radiation, how much radio nuclide concentrations there were in the in these various bombs. Particularly, what we want to know, because our interest is to shift shift the argument away from radioactive exposure in terms of dose towards exposure in terms of uh, inhalation of these alpha emitters like ura uranium uh, and the, beta, the two beta emitters tritium and carbon-14 which are all three of those substances were not really measured at the time because the Geiger counters that they used to to, 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 in, uh, to ensure that people were not being overexposed just don't detect alpha particles they don't they don't detect those soft beta emitters like carbon-14 and tritium so and, and yet it's quite obvious that the people who were doing the tests must have measured this stuff. So we just wanted to get hold of data that showed what they'd measured, but they just could, wouldn't give it to us. You see, so we asked the judge to to force them to give it to us. So that's what this is about. It's about disclosure. So the judge says, well, you know, you have to give them what they want, and they say, well, we're no, we're not going to. Uh, and so that was that was essentially what the arguments were. On, on that day um, and in, in my opinion we made quite reasonable advance on a couple of fronts I, I mean the most important thing that, that happened to my mind was it became quite clear as a result of the document that, that, that the, the order that the judge eventually produced after the hearing it became quite clear that the judge has figured out what the essential argument is in the case and this is quite a breakthrough because in the past the cases have always been associated with ionizing radiation exposure as measured by absorbed dose, you know, so many millisieverts this and so many millisieverts that. And, 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 I, and I have always argued that for internal radiation, you can't use dose. So we have to deal with the actual amounts of substances that were there that could have been inhaled by these people. And the most important one of these, of course, is uranium for us. 
So we're arguing that uranium is important. I mean, the bombs were made of uranium. I mean, that's what atomic bombs are made of. The, the, the hydrogen bombs have got a casing of depleted uranium to reflect the neutrons back into the fissile center so that the neutron density is very high and you get, and you get fusion, which produces the thermonuclear explosion. That's, that's how you do it. Okay? So there's tons and tons of uranium in these bombs. And according to Glassstone, there's about one ton per megaton. So in other words, if you have a three megaton um, thermonuclear weapon like the one at Christmas Island, the big grapple Y one, you're talking three tons of uranium. So that goes bang and it all showers down as little particles and then the men can inhale it or it comes down in the rain and the men can inhale it and it becomes incorporated into the soil and then it's resuspended and the men can inhale it. And so th this, th this is, but at the same time, you can't measure it with a Geiger counter because as I know, having been to Iraq and Kosovo looking for uranium, Uranium is an alpha emitter, and it's really quite hard to find. And if somebody's totally contaminated with uranium all over his body, like one of our men, one of one of the appellants, Don Battersby, was was uh, given the job of cleaning down aircraft which had flown through the mushroom cloud, uh, and a lot of that material would have been ura uranium. You see, 99 percent of the in terms of mass is uranium. Anyway, so that was the first thing that that, that the judge obviously has figured out that, that's, that, that this is now in, we're now into new territory because the ICRP risk model, the one that has been hitherto used in order to assess the dose and therefore the probability of getting cancer, that model doesn't work for uranium because uranium binds to the DNA. And he's figured all of this stuff. As I, I, and I'll read you some of, the, um, some of his reasons because he, he gives reasons for what, what he's going to do. And, and what, he's going to, what he's done is he said, okay, we're going to we're going to ask the Ministry of Defence to give us everything they've got that Dr. Busby wants, and then they say, well, you know, we haven't got anything. We've looked as well as we can, and we can't find anything. But we we did find some things. Uh, but but the things that we found, they then said were top secret, and they weren't going to give it give them to us because if they gave them to us, it would it would break the Official Secrets Act, and they would be releasing stuff into the public domain that might help a terrorist to make a bomb. So that's the essential argument. So, that's, But the judge says, but on the other hand, you know, if Dr. Busby needs that information to make his case, then we will ask you to give it to him. So at that point, the Ministry of Defence, well, the Secretary of State for Defence's lawyer, his QC, he gets up and he says, well, well, in that case, we're going to ask for a public indemnity certificate to, to, and we're going to argue in court that it would affect Britain's status as a world power or it would affect, you know, the, 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 the ability of terrorists to make bombs, that sort of thing. So that will be argued out in a, in a new new court, um, which I think involves the House of Lords. So it's quite a heavy thing. So then the judge said, well, all right, well, we don't want, don't want to go down that route unless we have to. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to ask Dr. Busby to um, try and get a, another scientist, a chap called Professor Regan, who has got security clearance to go and have a look at these secret documents and see if he can turn them into some form that the Ministry of Defence thinks is not going to, uh, you know, is not going to affect their their position in terms of secrecy quite so much. So instead of saying like, you know, the amount of uranium here is like 450 kilograms, they will say something like, oh, it's between 200 kilograms and 900 kilograms, that kind of thing. You see. And so the judge is just going to, and, and then when that's done, assuming that all gets done, the judge will then ask me whether I think that that's good enough to make my case. And I'll either say yes or no, depending upon what they do, you see. And if I say no, then of course it will have to go to this PII thing. So that will be quite a heavy, heavy thing. That, that will. Um, that's the uh, House, House of Lords, basically. I think. I think so. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a, really a lawyer on that sort of level, so I'm not entirely sure. But it's some very, very high up. Uh, tribunal that, in, that, that I think involves law lords or, you know, Supreme Court or whatever they call it nowadays. Um, so, that, so that's the deal in terms of the disclosure. And the other thing is that, the, that, that, that he's going to order disclosure on is he's going to order the Environment Agency to provide for me the, um, all of the data they have relating to the material that was repatriated from Christmas Island in 2007, I think it was. They, they went over there and they did various surveys and they found a lot of radioactive stuff there and they put it all in drums and brought it all back to England and buried it at Teesside, at Port Clarence, at Tea, on Teesside. So all that stuff was buried up. So a lot of radioactive stuff up there. But do, do, do you know, I just can't get any data on, on what was in it. 
I mean, obviously they measured what was in it and they did all sorts of gamma spectroscopy and this and that, but, the, but I haven't been given the results. So he's asking the Environment Agency to give me those results or ordering them to. Uh, and then the third thing that he's ordered is the release of the data from the University of Dundee for the uh, genetic damage study that was done by Sue Rabbit Roth in 1998. Um, the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association um, had a questionnaire study that was, that was run by uh, this journalist woman called Susan Rabbit Roth, and it was funded by Catherine Cookson, who writes the novels. Quite, I think £100,000 or something she paid for this. And that data was all... Was all um, collected by Rabbit Roth and then t and then she wrote a paper on it but the paper well it's not worthless you know but it doesn't have it doesn't really have any numbers it just says oh ah, you know this is very bad and, oh dear that was very bad and they seem to have an awful lot of this sort of genetic damage and so forth there were there, there, there were no numbers no real numbers that enable us to do any statistics you see so uh, some time ago I asked the BNTVA if I could have that data and they gave me a letter of authority to get hold of it from the University of Dundee. But the university has refused to release it then. And so I've asked the judge to order them to release it. So if, And they have already said that if he orders them to release it, they're going to go to the Scottish House of Lords, what they call the Court of Appeal, Court of Sessions. And they're, so they're also going to refuse to release this stuff. So it's all, it's all quite a big punch up. So, I mean, so anyway. So in terms of releasing the, the, that particular doc document from Dundee then, um, of course, what we do know is that the British government has uh, basically offered uh, the British nuclear test veterans roughly about 20 odd million uh, pounds for the damages, genetic damages over 10 generations, I believe it is. Uh, on, uh, well, I have heard that. But then on the other hand, I've also heard that that isn't the case. So I, I'm not quite sure. I wouldn't like to say that that's true. Well, it was uh, on the British it... nuclear test veterans uh, when, when they actually did the, the, their report on their website, you know. Uh, that that did crop up, but whether it's there still, I don't know. Well, I think I think that uh, one of the solicitors who was working in the previous cases investigated it and said that, that, that actually nobody's offered them anything. But if, if they had offered if they had offered them uh, 20 million, it wouldn't be very much money compared to the number of offspring that have got genetic damage. You know. Sure, and, so, and the fact is that this has been well publicised in the media that of the 20 million uh, offer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, anyway, so if I can. The, the, I, I've got here the, the order, and at the end of the order it says reasons for the decision, and, and I'll read you a little bit of that because actually it's extremely important and interesting because it takes us forward into completely new territory with regard to this business of the test veterans, and and so what uh, I'll just I'll just read you a, a few lines from it because they show you the sort of way in which the judge is thinking, and I and I'm, I'm absolutely amazed and uh, and tremendously happy that this judge has actually figured out what it is that I'm trying to say. Because I can tell you that in all of the other previous arguments, and I, I put these arguments before the upper tier as well, before uh, Sir William Charles, and honestly, they didn't seem to, they couldn't figure out what it was that I was trying to say, but eventually it sunk in, sunk in. So here we are, number six in this, in this reasons. He writes, this is Sir Nicholas Blake. He writes, the explosions were the products of devices composed of fissile material, including uranium or plutonium, surrounded by tamper material, including depleted uranium and chemical explosive. A consequence of the explosions is ionizing radiation through alpha, beta and gamma rays or neutron radiation. Well, we all agree that. But anyway, he goes on. Seven, Dr. Busby, who now represents the appellants Battersby and Smith, raises a number of new points not previously determined. So like we're in new territory now. See, one. Uranium and other elements released by detonation are a source of risk to human health by means that are not identified in conventional measurements of ionizing radiation as above, and in particular a source of damage to the DNA systems of the human body. 2. The International Radiation Protection Authority's guidance on the safe maxima for exposure to ionizing radiation is insufficient to screen out all risks to human health arising from explosions of the kind undertaken in Maralinga and Christmas Island. In particular, those who are assessed to have received a radiation dose of less than 100 millisieverts may still develop cancer or other medical conditions as a result of exposure to the product of the explosions. Three, since uranium damage may not be identified in traditional monitoring methods or assessments, it is necessary to assess the likelihood of risk by other means, including a, the quantity of uranium used to make the device, either as the core charge or the tamper material, the amount of residue measured after the explosion, 
and b epidemiological data about clusters of genetic disorders suffered by service personnel who have been exposed to the product of an explosion i mean so those three things are essentially my core case and this is the first time i've seen them written down and this is the first time that this will have appear that will appear in this form in in a major trial you know well not a trial this is a tribunal but effectively it's a trial um in 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 the high court in london yeah, so so that, that's that, that that item seven is really an amazing advance. You know, we now we now have identified three absolutely new um, areas where where we are arguing stuff, which which are we, 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 so argue, putting arguments away from this idea that oh the absorbed dose was too low to cause cancer. I mean, what what I'm saying is, of course, dose doesn't work for internal radiations. And therefore, you know, what would have been considered to be low dose is actually quite capable of causing cancer. And this is what the judge has figured out and he's written it down. So that's hurrah for the judge, you know. So obviously, in terms of that particular report from Dundee, then, which would certainly uh, put a lot of weight to some of that, those three points uh, uh, if, if, that, if, if they manage to block it, which they're obviously going to, they've said they're going to, so if they do manage to block it, what would be your backup? Where would be your backup? Um... Well, of course, I've got my own study. You know, there was the study that we did of the same people, the, uh, of the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association, and that study was, was published in, in the peer review. But, of course, the problem is that the judge in the upper tier now says that Busby can't be an expert. I mean, so they might well see. I mean, I can see that Heppenstorfer, you know, that the Secretary of State lawyers will come along and say, well, OK, you know, there's this other study by this bloke Busby. But, you know, we're not allowed to look at anything by Busby because he's not an expert because he's been ruled out by the upper tier, you see. So that's why this other stuff is quite important. Um, so we can put that other, we can get somebody else to analyze that and then they'll say, well, you know, in the witness box then and I'll call them and then they'll say, hey, uh, you know, this shows that these um, genetic damage, dis genetic disorders were caused because after all, you know, the point is that if, if, if I, I said to the judge, I mean, I actually said this in the, you know, while I was arguing all this stuff in the high court, I was standing up there, you know, like Perry Mason or somebody. And I said, look, you know, if, if some, if, if everybody had a little dial on their head, which registered genetic damage and radiation and registered radiation, you know, with a, like a little red, red mark that said, if you get into this part, you know, something bad will happen, then it would be great. We wouldn't have to worry about this. We could just get all the test veterans and have a look at the dial on their, on their head. And then, you know, we say, well, look, they got exposed to radiation. But, but we don't. But on, in a sense, I said, well, my Lord, you know, there, there is a way in which we can do this by retrospectively uh, looking at their genetic damage through the effects on their children. Because after all, genetic damage is not a disease that you can catch, you know. So if they were all stationed at Christmas Island and all of them, or a very high proportion of them, or much higher proportion of them than should have, got children with like, you know, genetic deformities and holes in their heart and spina bifida and hydrocephalus and all of the stuff that we found, yeah. then it's, it's kind of retrospective or objective evidence that they were exposed to something that causes genetic damage. Now, what else could it be but their radiation exposure at Christmas Island? Because that's the only thing that they shared. Apart from that, they were that once they left the National Service, they were bu bu butchers and bakers and candlestick makers and you know what, you know, all different people. So the only thing that they shared in, that they had in common was uh, um, that the time that they spent at the nuclear test sites. And look here, they've all got children with, with you know, two heads. Anyway, so 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 obviously that he he took that on board and 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 accepted the epidemiological data as he writes about clusters of genetic disorders, is actually a, an objective indicator that they were exposed whatever their dose was. Do you see? Yeah, yeah. So that's that 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 sort of makes it a little bit easier for you to say. Well, it's so. very good. It's yeah. very good because Stubbs wouldn't allow that in. In the in the previous first tier, he got quite shirty about bringing in data relating to genetic damage in the children. So this is a definite advance. This one. Certainly, and there's been certainly so that, some, yeah. some other... Yeah, so, some, oh, go on, sorry. Well, so then he goes on in this document to say, with that brief background, Dr. Busby seeks disclosure from the Secretary of State for Defence of material that may be broadly defined as follows. One, data retained by AWE about the uranium content and ratios of uranium in the devices before detonation and the residues measured after explosion. 
and two similar data by other tests conducted by the UK or the USA after relevant periods of the appellant's presence at Maralinga Christmas Island as a, as a means of back calculation as the uranium contact and content and ratios. Um, three, any data relating to test sites that may reveal the presence of other elements capable of causing risk to health that may not be reflected in a conventional dose assessment. So there we have, uh, have uh, um, tritium and carbon-14, you see, so he's taken that one on board. And finally, contemporary photographs of the relative, relevant explosion. So we can see whether the, the fireball actually or the shock wave hits the ground sufficiently hard to, to create a lot of dust which then gets sucked up with a lot of water from the sea because these were over the sea these explosions which then goes up into the mushroom cloud and then rains down as black rain like it did in Hiroshima you see so I mean this is really quite a good quite a good analysis of what it is I'm saying and then and then he also says we nature of waste removed from Christmas Island around the time of independence of Kiribati and then research data used in an academic study of the clusters of genetic orders uh, disorders and illnesses Excellent. So, so you know, this is like heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. I'm, I'm really impressed with that, Judge. Yeah. No, it sounds like uh, sounds like it, there's uh, some fairness going on there. That's for sure. Well, we certainly, well, we certainly hope so. I mean, the other judge, Stubbs, was very fair, but the problem is that I never got my stuff in front of him. Whenever I did get my stuff in front of him, we won the case. But uh, you know what happened was that they pushed me out in, in the previous first tier. So so all of the stuff I was saying, which this, which I'm now also saying to this judge, what was there in front of Hugh Stubbs, but it never it never got incorporated into the decision. You see, so that's why they lost the case. Okay. And um, uh, generally, just talking about the technical aspects, where are you going from here? Uh, what, when's the next court case? Has there been any delays? Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Well, what what happened? What, what's happening? Well, we put in our we put in our four ex, our expert reports uh, around about October, and uh, and so they were supposed to put in their expert reports um, before this hearing, in fact. But in fact, they didn't. And then they asked for an extension. They put in one of them, which was an enormous report, 280 pages, and then they said that they wanted um, they wanted to have a, a six another six weeks. Uh, to, to get their to get the other two reports in which was like very strange so we tried to say that we didn't want that it was too long and you know we couldn't understand why they were doing it and this and that but uh, but it looked like uh, he, he accepted their argument that that they had to have another six weeks to sort of digest what it is what it whatever it was that the first expert was saying so all that's happening uh, and then I have I have to ask Paddy Regan various questions assuming Paddy Regan that you know takes on this this uh, this look, looking into the secret documents to see if he can find some way in which he can tell me what they say, which will enable me to, to, to run the case. And that's got to be done. Um, so I've got to do that by the end of this month. Uh, and then then they produce all their reports. Then we have to ask some questions about their reports. Uh, and then, the, you know, and then it all goes on like that. Then they ask us our, our experts questions about their reports. And then we put in all our final statement of claim. And, and each one of these things has a date, you know. So, so, so there will be another hearing where we're going with all of this. And ultimately, we are having that the, the the actual trial, that the the the, 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 the tr tribunal hearing, is uh, is scheduled for June, to 2016, and it's going to last 15 days. And I'm going to have to I, you know, I'm poor little Christopher, you know, age 70, poor Dada. Is going to have to stand up in court, and or, you know, and and do all, do do all his thing over 15 days in London. You know, I I, I don't know, and that, with all on no money, of course, too. So I've got no mates in London that I can stay with at the moment because they've all bogged off up to other places. So I'm going to find I'm going to have to sit in some crappy bed and breakfast place and stagger into the high court every day. To, to conduct this case, the only I mean, my mates, you are all right, my mates. Well, Andrew Ades lives in Cornwall and his wife is ill. So he can't come except occasionally. And then I've got Di Williams, who's helping me, you know, with a lot of the paperwork. But he's an old guy like me. And, uh, and nobody's paying him either, you know, to do any of this. And he's doing tons and tons of photocopying and staggering it under like my, the amount of the amount of paper involved in this, the actual trial bundle. I don't know. It's about 25 box files or something like that. And you've got to actually physically wheel this stuff into the into the court, you know. 
Oh, and he lives he lives out of London, so he's got to come in on the train with his 25 box files and so forth. I mean, you know, it's it's so unfair because the Secretary of State has got a whole kind of, you know, he's got a, like a, a a ship full of people and 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 you know, millions of pounds to pay them, and and they've got all their systems worked out and everything, and we're we're kind of doing this on zero money. Unbelievable, it is, you know, unbelievable. Well, maybe a bit of a shout out for funding here. I mean, uh, who do people contact to for funding? The, well, low level radiation campaign. We'll all do it. We're doing it all through that. So Richard Bramhall, he, he'll sort it all out. So if you go to the low level radiation campaign. That I think they've got a donate button. I don't know if it's working, but I've, I've told them to try and see if it's working. But so basically, just send a check to the address of Richard Bramhall, you know, and say and write on the back of it for the test veterans. Well, believe um, it's fine. Because the other, th the other thing we've got to do is we've got to fly our, our expert witnesses in from all, all four corners of the globe. We're bringing Sho Soji Sawada in from, uh, from, from Japan, you know. So we've got to bring him all that. When we can't bring him cattle class, I mean, you know, he's like 80 years old. So we've got to bring him sort of in reasonable luxury, you know, or he'll probably die on the flight. Anyway, I mean, it's a bit I of a mean, laugh. So basically, what we're doing on the article, we'll put up a LLRC address and also a phone number for Richard Bramall uh, if people would like yeah, to contact yeah. him direct and organise something else. Well, they can uh, they can phone me. I'm, I'm quite happy to talk to anybody about all of this, you know. And in fact, sure. of course, they can send the money to me if they want to. Sure. I mean, it will all, it will all go into the, into one one pot, so that we have it all in one place, so we know what we can do and and how much we can do and what we can't do and everything, you know. And uh, where's the website that people can get your phone number from? Your 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 contact details. Um. I th I think I think uh, I think I think it's on Green Audit actually. I think it's on www.greenaudit.org. Dot org. Right. Yeah. Green yeah. Audit. Yeah. Um, all right. So, OK, well, we'll put the green audit. We'll put the LLRC links in. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's quite important because we're challenging the ICRP dose model here. And uh, it's it's a big first. Um, it sounds like the the, the, um, the scope you've been given has, has expanded. And, and uh, you know, the judge's uh, uh, points that he's made uh, should really get, get you those uh, documents, even the one, you know, from the university. Uh, because they would seem it would be uh, very uh, it would be very suspicious if they carried on uh, trying to stop you getting to those documents before the June. Well, they're they're going to argue that that, that that it's a question of confidentiality and that if we because of course we're not asking for anybody's name, so we the documents are basically the questionnaires the questionnaires, and and we just say well give us the questionnaires, but just rub out the names with a, with a felt tip so we can't see who the guy's name is but then they say well oh you might be able to distinguish who the person is on the basis of of their um, you know where they were at what time or so, you know I, I, it's just it's just not really believable so you'll, I mean, you'll just be running off basic statistics uh, out yeah of that's all i mean so what we'll do is we we'll take all of their their um, questionnaires and we'll put them into an excel file you know and and there'll just be a list of how many people that they that answered the questionnaire, and there'll be a list of how many people who've got hydrocephalus and spina bifida, and then you just like, add them all up, and you say, well, like, okay, there were like, let's say, I think there are 2,000 responses, and there were like 150, you know, hydrocephalus, and and if you look at the normal rate in the population of that age at the time, there should only have been three, you know. And so, so, it's really so basically, quite the stuff. university's uh, uh, complaints are are basically sort of, uh, you know. Well, not worth the, the uh, whatever it's. Uh... No, absolutely, absolutely. That, 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 but that's also the case at the moment for cancer registries too. You know, they won't give you, they won't tell you how many people in a small area close to a nuclear plant suffered from leukemia. And when you say, well, why? They say, oh, well, because you might be able to identify them. I mean, if you knew that, like in a in an area where there were like two thousand five hundred people, they're really they are really actually saying, well, you know, and there were like two leukemias. And the fact that you knew that there were two leukemias there and not three would enable you to be able to figure out, you know, who the person was that had leukemia. Then you go around and say, ha ha, I know that you've got leukemia, ha ha. I mean, it's just absurd. No, no, totally. So, all right. So, I mean, the bottom line is, is uh, uh, you know, the fact that, that they use those excuses to stop uh, independent you know, epidemiologists trying to access the data and, and make something off them, you know. I mean, we certainly saw in Japan Professor Suda, who basically uh, got the data that was just sitting there 
And he was the only person in four years that bothered to actually look at the data. And the data clearly proved there's a connection between a nuclear accident uh, in Fukushima Daiichi um, and, uh, and sort of uh, thyroid cancers in, in young people. So uh, we need independent epidemiologists uh, to get this data. Um, and even in Japan, an independent uh, the epidemiologist was able to get to the data. In the UK, totally different thing though, yeah? Well, in Japan, the same. I mean, he got the data because they were doing these thyroid uh, surveys with ultrasound. But there is also data about the number of ch 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 children with leukemia near Fukushima, but they're not going to let you have that. They're not going to let anybody have that, or brain tumors, or, or, or heart attacks, or whatever, you know? All that data is exist exists in Japan, but it's secret. Well, they, they made it secret uh, in 2013 when they brought in their new... No, it's, it's, always, it's always been secret. It's always been secret. Right. You, um, you, well, you can't, for they, incidents, you can get, you can get sometimes get mortality data. But once you get down to small areas, that, that more or less there's, a, there's collusion between all the cancer registries in the world now, since about 1990, to not allow any information on incidents in small areas. They, they won't do it. That's right, yeah. Uh, I, I, I managed to get I managed to get the Michael Meacher, the, the late Michael Meacher, who was a sort of mate of mine. I got it. I got him to to push the cancer registries again, and they kept saying, "Oh well, you know, the numbers are so small, so you won't be able to." So I told him to ask them for uh, ten years of data. All right. So like maybe you know, if the numbers are small in one year, you can ask for ten years and add it all together. So we want to know close to the nuclear site how many leukemias in in ten years. You know, and then further away from the nuclear site, how many leukemias in 10 years? So they couldn't pull that thing about confidentiality because the numbers were small. So they, so at that point, he was sacked. They, you know, he was kicked, Tony Blair sacked him. I think that was the reason he was sacked, actually, because he was homing in on this issue of, of small area cancer data. Right, right, that's interesting. Yeah, he, he did some good stuff, I have to say. Yeah, he was, he was a great guy. Right. Anyway, <clears throat> on, that, uh, on that note... Um, I'd like to thank you, Chris Busby, for uh, such an interesting uh, sort of uh, update on what's been happening. Um, and we'll definitely be covering this in the future. Uh, the links and everything will be put onto an article. Um, I'll pop this up onto SoundCloud now, and uh, I'll work on an article, and then I'll start posting that around everywhere and let people know what's going on. Thank you okay, so okay, much. Okay, sure. Thank you, thank you for, for uh, allowing me to say this. I, I think it's important that the test veterans know what's going on, you know, and that, that somebody gives them a rough idea of where we're going with all this and how well it's going. It is going quite well.